Hi, this is Phil Chandler on a sunny day towards the end of March 2019 and I thought you might like to have a look around this apiary that I'm restoring that used to belong to Brother Adam. There's still plenty of work to be done here but we've made a good start and this is going to be, I think, a, a great place to keep bees once we've got it sorted. Um, it did actually used to belong to Brother Adam of Buckfast Abbey and we think he established an apiary there sometime probably in the early 70s, although nobody's really sure. But you can see that his concrete plinths that he used to use for his big dadent hives are still in place. In fact, that one's actually been displaced because it was the pair of this one here, which is now the mount for this zest hive, which I built last year and still needs a roof. That's another project I've got to do. This is a pair of concrete plinths that are in this, exactly the same position as they were when they were installed here. So they've been here for, what, 50 years or so. I'm just going to move this junk out of the way before I go any further. So this stand at the front here is a wooden stand which is a Brother Adam original, in fact and you can see that it sits directly onto the concrete plinths and it's uh, held in place by these four brass studs. You can just see one here, I think. And the leg has a hole in it. Each leg has a hole in it that locates onto that brass stud. You'll also notice that there are cutaways here and here, both sides of the stand, so that the, the, uh, the floor of the hive, which you can see right here, this is an original Brother Adam a modified Dadent hive, um, you can see that it actually sits in those little rebates there, which holds it very secure. Um, and, you know, literally this, this, hive, this uh, hive can't be moved in any direction once it's located on there. This is one of Brother Adam's original modified Dadent hives. It's a big beast. It's um, in old money, it's 20 inches square and a foot deep, or roughly half a meter square and uh, 30 centimeters deep. So, and here's the frames. Um, it's actually got, yeah, here we go. This is an original um, Dadent frame. It's equivalent to the Jumbo Langstroth frame. It's the same size as that. 19 inch top bar and uh, that's one of the original crown boards still in good nick so I've, I've just lifted the body of the hive off and you can see on the floor here is a mesh floor that I actually designed when I worked at the Abbey uh, in 2005 um, 2006 I designed these um, screened conversion boards that go directly onto the original floor so this this is the original floor and of course it would normally be facing uh, in one of the four four possible directions outwards from the center um, and the bees would come in here of course and these little um, metal bars here which were screwed onto the front were intended to take the hooks from the um, landing boards which Brother Adam used to use which were quite large and used to rest on the ground in front of the hive. I don't use those, um, in fact we used to call them uh, mouse ramps. The way I designed this to be used once mesh floors became de rigueur in the early 2000s, um, the idea here is that the, the mesh floor is made to lock directly over the original floor like that and now the bees come in here on this slope and the mesh is there to uh, allow varroa mites to fall through of course this is a, an epoxy coated steel mesh and the white board the inspection board so you can see how many mites have dropped goes in the slot at the back which is was the original floor so it was a it was a conversion kit um, for the hives at the abbey um, that I designed and it was actually made by the Abbey uh, carpenter for us and uh, we had quite a few of these made up but of course shortly after I left 
uh, they converted to Langstroth equipment and uh, so the, these old hives gradually became redundant. I've still got a few of them. Um, I've got be even got bees in a couple of them. So anyway, there we go, Brother Adam's kit. And you can see the layout here. There's two concrete plinths laid side by side, a couple of feet apart. And there would have been originally two stands, one on each of the concrete plinths, two wooden stands. And on each stand would have had um, each stand would have had two hives on it. So there would be four four hives in a group. All the entrance would, entrances would have been pointing mutually at right angles. So, for example, this, this entrance might have been pointed this way and the next hive entrance would have been pointing out that way. The hive that would have been sitting over there on the left hand side would be pointing out that way and the, finally the hive that was sitting on this corner would have been pointing out to my right, which is approximately east in fact. So the idea was that you would stand on this spot right here in the middle of these four hives and then you would rotate. You would start with, with any one hive and you would take the, um, the lid and the super if necessary off that hive, put it onto the one to your left, uh, so using the, one, the hive to your left as a stand and then you would inspect this hive here put it all back together again, rotate through 90 degrees, go to the next hive, use the previous one as the, as the stand, rotate to 90 degrees again when you finish with that one and so forth. So you could stand in one spot and check four hives, uh, which was a very efficient system and uh, Brother Adam was all about efficiency. When I took this apiary over, it was waist high in brambles and you can see I've actually left some brambles uh, growing at the side here because they do flower nicely towards the um, middle of the season and the bees love brambles. Um, I've just got three three colonies on here with um, in polynukes at the moment. There's a bee on my neck trying to sting me so I'm just going to take her away. So uh, these, these are just waiting to go into proper hives and you can see there's another pair of concrete plinths here which would once have had hives on them. So it's been a, it's been a lot of work to uh, restore this apiary. There's still quite a lot to do. As you can see down here there's um, a pile of brushwood waiting to be burned um, or otherwise dif disposed of but probably burned. In, in the corner there um, there's a magnificent holly tree, probably the biggest holly tree I've ever seen and um, a number of others here. There's a nice oak tree overlooking us with uh, plentiful ivy on it and that ivy feeds the bees just towards the end of the season. That's the last thing to flower here. Throughout the apiary you've got a lot of flowers. There's just some little, I'm not sure what these are. I should know but I can't remember their name coming into flower. I planted some apple trees. There's, there's four apple trees in here just uh, planted just before Christmas. And you'll also see that I've made stands for top bar hives and I've actually used the original concrete plinths and I've made stands to sit on those plinths to hold the top bar hives. There are already four top bar hives in place, in position, they're not uh, occupied yet and in fact there's still a little bit of work to be done on them. I've got to install the uh, eco floor properly on each one. And over here, as I mentioned already, the Zest Hive, which um, is in need of a roof, and that's probably my next job, in fact. I shall just uh, move these lumps of wood off the top and I can show you more of that. So these, uh, these boards that are resting on the top now are just there to keep the rain out. Uh, they will in fact form the sides of the roof. It's going to be rather a large and rather heavy roof. Um, so we'll see how that works out. And inside you can see the, uh, the deep frames waiting to be waxed and uh, put into place. I'm going to actually have two colonies in this hive because it's a big hive. And I'm going to have um, one colony at each end, divider in the middle 
and one end is going to have a low entrance and the other end will have a high entrance. Uh, this is an experiment. Um, the originator of this hive, the designer of the hive, Bill Summers, swears by high entrances and um, he says that when he uses a high entrance the bees actually store the honey underneath the brood. Now I've never seen that but I, then again I don't use high entrances so um, I'm curious as to see how that works and to see if, if that actually happens on my colonies. Um, so I want to do a running comparison of uh, top entrance and bottom entrance on this zest hive which is made from um, lightish weight uh, insulation blocks with a the, there's a wooden frame on the top here which is what holds the um, frames in place stops them moving around and uh, provides a well it will provide a weather, weather tight seal once I've got the roof on it so that's the zest hive the top bar hives I'm arranging as I said already on uh, brother Adam's original um, concrete plinths using specially designed stands and uh, this one's just being used as a storage depot for uh, top bars at the moment but they've all got hinged roofs um, they haven't yet got uh, stops installed so otherwise I, I could let go of that roof and it would stop about there um, I do like hinged roofs because they, uh, they, only, they can be lifted easily with one hand which you can't really do with a, a takeoff roof obviously and uh, this one over here has got uh, some six inch industrial guttering in it which will become the eco floor that's going to sit in the bottom of the hive up until recently we have been using uh, tree ties to actually tie the eco floor underneath uh, the hive but that hasn't actually worked out terribly well because the inevitably the tea, the, tr the tree ties stretch a little bit and that creates uh, little gaps and um, informal entrances for things other than bees and we don't want that there's plenty of wildflowers in this apiary and I shall be planting more in due course I put a few uh, narcissi in the end of last year they cut they've already fl uh, flowered and finished there'll be other things coming up soon there's some there'll be some uh, herbs in here too there are, there's lavender and there's some um, rosemary and various other things in there I'm gonna sow things like borage and phacelia on the areas of soil that don't have anything much growing on them at the moment uh, all good bee plants I'm encouraging um, pollen producing uh, trees and down around the front of the heart of the of the apiary here there's going to be a hedge which is going to be um, native hardwoods of course so there'll be uh, things like hazel and beech and birch and um, hawthorn blackthorn and uh, maybe a little bit of holly and various other th bits and pieces in that hedge so it's going to be a, a nice um, protection against the weather because this is a windy spot we're looking out right now we're looking pretty much south and it's uh, the, the wind comes from most of the wind comes from between um, south and south west or south and west anyway that's the prevailing winds and as you can see it's very open here to those winds the, they come across that field up the hill and hit the apiary quite hard so uh, we do need some weather protection along this front and so that's another job I've got to do. As you can see there's, uh, there's plenty of wildflowers growing close by. We're not short of flowers around here. Uh, we've got a little shed here of course because every beekeeper needs a shed. Oh an important thing about this site uh, and this is something that I really encourage beekeepers to do um, whenever you possibly can is to create habitat for other pollinators other bees particularly because they are probably much more under threat than our honeybees are nobody's actually nobody's looking after them nobody's breeding them nobody's um, nobody nobody very much is creating habitat for them on any particular scale so I think it's it's something that beekeepers can do 
which is to leave areas like this to go wild. You can see here I've left an area in the middle of the apiary uh, which is going to be not really touched at all. I'm just going to let that go wild. And there's another little patch here and of course there's all the area at the back there uh, down in the dip which um, will be allowed to do its own thing and the, the margins along the, the hedge here will all be allowed to do as they please and the area here around the a couple of the apple trees so there's lots of scope here for habitat for other bees particularly bumblebees and solitaries um, to make their own nests there's also importantly there's embankments uh, over here I'm clearing some land here so there's a there's a nice bank there which still has uh, remains of uh, rabbit burrows and things in it um, and probably mice and various other small mammals and that's the sort of place where bumblebees will most likely look for places to make their nests and over here there's another bank which is an old an old Devon hedge as you can see it's all uh, raw material there's rocks and earth all exposed and this is the sort of place that things like ivy bees might decide to live so if you have access to this kind of land and I, I consider myself very lucky to be able to use these uh, these areas for apiaries if you have access to this kind of land or even in your garden um, you can still leave some space, some land, some untidiness for other pollinators to make their nests. There's the holly tree I mentioned earlier, multi-trunked holly tree, one of the biggest I've seen anywhere. They're pretty common around here. So there we go, that's the apiary, one of the apiaries I'm restoring and uh, I shall make more videos about this in due course through the season and we'll see how it all goes. So I'll see you in the next video.